नमस्कार प्राध्यापक राम बापट स्मृति व्याख्यान मध्य वती मैं अपने सर्व मनापासन स्वागत करते या व्याख्यान मे मध्य अगर मगर वर्षापर्यत श्रीयुत सदानंद मेनन श्रीयुत गुलाम मोहम्मद शेख प्राध्यापक शिव विश्वनाथन प्राध्यापक के सच्चिदानंदन श्रीयुत टी एम कृष्णा आणि प्राची देशपांडे यांनी आपले विचार पुष्प गुंफलेले आता या सर्वांचे विचार पुष्प आपण युट्यूबवरती सुद्धा ऐकू शकतो आज या व्याख्यान मालेतलं सातवं व्याख्यान इथे होणार आहे आणि हे सातवं पुष्प गुंफणार आहेत प्रसिद्ध तत्वज्ञ प्राध्यापक सुंदर स्वरूप काही आणि त्यांच्या व्याख्यानाचा विषय आहे ट्रुथ पॉलिटिक्स अँड थिएटर सत्य राजकारण आणि रंगभूमी हे भाषण इंग्रजी भाषेतून होणार आहे आणि आजच्या व्याख्यानाच्या अध्यक्षस्थानी असणार आहेत सुप्रसिद्ध ज्येष्ठ विचारवंत प्राध्यापक गोपाळ गुरु मी आता मकरंद साठे यांना विनंती करतो की त्यांनी प्राध्यापक सुंदर सरुक्क आणि गोपाळ गुरु यांना मंचावर आमंत्रित करावं परिमल चौधरी राज फाउंडेशनच्या संचालिका परिमल चौधरी यांना विनंती करतो की त्यांनी आजच्या पाहुण्यांचं पुष्पगुच्छ देऊन स्वागत करावं या व्याख्यान मालेची कल्पना सुचल्यापासून ती संपूर्णपणे कार्यान्वित करण्यासाठी त्याच्या आयोजन नियोजनामध्ये ज्यांनी मदत केली अशा प्राश फाउंडेशनच्या संचालिका श्रीमती परिमल चौधरी साधना साप्ताहिक पाक्षिक परिवर्तनाचा वाटस्वरूप मासिक आंदोलन शाश्वत विकासासाठी सर्व मराठी आणि इंग्रजी वृत्तपत्र आणि वृत्तचित्र संपादक वार्ता प्रतिनिधी ऑल इंडिया रेडिओ पुणे पुणे स्टेशन एस एम जोशी सभागृहाचे व्यवस्थापक आणि सर्व कर्मचारी बार्स एन टोन्सचे सर्व सहकारी ध्वनी व्यवस्था पाहणारे महेश गायकवाड आणि सहकारी आणि आपण सर्व उपस्थित बापट सर प्रेमी जन हो ज्यांनी ज्यांनी प्रत्यक्ष किंवा अप्रत्यक्ष मदत केली अशा सर्वांचे मी मनापासून आभार मानतो त्यांना धन्यवाद देतो आता मकरांसाठे हे आपल्या प्रमुख पाहुण्यांची आणि अध्यक्षांची ओळख करून देतील परिचय करून देतील आणि बापट स्मृती व्याख्यानमाला करण्याबाबतची भूमिका ते मांडतील त्याच्यानंतर सुंदर सरुक यांचं भाषण होईल आणि मग गोपाळ गुरु आपले अध्यक्ष अध्यक्षीय विचार व्यक्त करतील आणि कार्यक्रम संपेल आपल्याला प्रेमळ विनंती की आपण मोबाईल फोन आपले स्विच ऑफ करून ठेवावे मी मकरनला विनंती करतो की त्यांनी Good evening, everybody. Uh, as Gajanan has uh, said, uh, this is the seventh year of this memorial series. So I won't go into details of why we started it, but there may be some new faces here, young ones. So I would like to talk in two minutes about Professor Bapat. Professor Bapat was, a, was not only an extraordinary intellect, an extraordinary intellectual mainly he was a extraordinary public intellectual many of us like me kajanan paranspare from theater or literature many political social activists many intellectuals from all fields from philosophy to political science to sociology have been indebted to him because of his personal uh, rapport with all of us uh, there is we talk about many divisions in the society 
the division in the in the society between the intellectuals and the common man is probably one of the worst and hard hitting most hard hitting Bapat used to single handedly bridge single handedly bridge this gap we don't have the capacity to do it ourselves so Bapa, what we thought was that we'll bring in somebody like professor rukai who has a similar width of world view and depth of knowledge who is equally importantly a public intellectual public intellectual to continue Bapat's work so i will introduce him in short uh, this year we have been lucky to get the well-known philosopher Professor Sundar Sarukai. His uh, achievements and publications are huge. I am really giving only the gist of it. Professor Sarukai is studied physics and philosophy and has a PhD from Purdue University, USA. He was a faculty at the National Institute of Advanced Studies from 1994 to 2009. Then founder director of the Manipal Center for Philosophy and Humanities from 2010 to 2016, after which he rejoined NIS and was a professor of philosophy till 2019. He is now pursuing his academic and educational interests independently. Professor Sarukai's work is primarily in the philosophy of natural and social sciences. He has written numerous articles. He is the author of following books. Translating the world's science and language, philosophy of his symmetry, Indian philosophy and philosophy of science, the what is science, and two books co-authored with chairperson today, Professor Gopal Guru, The Cracked Mirror and Indian Debate and Experience in Theory, 2012, and most recently Experience Caste and the Everyday Social. And just as we were talking inside, they are planning a third book, and that would that that's that would be very interesting indeed. Uh, he has been uh, co-chief editor at Springer Handbook of Logical Thought in India. He has also been very active in outreach programs to take philosophy to different communities and places, as well as bringing philosophy to public through his writing in the Hindu. By the way, he is also an excellent playwright. We are very lucky to have an equally eminent political scientist in the chair. He has also co-authored two books, as I said, with Professor Sarukai, Professor Gopal Guru. Professor Guru is in is from Pune, originally, so was Professor Ram Bapar's colleague in the uh, as is well known to us. After his stint in the Savitri Bhai Fule University, he, he was a professor at the Department of Politics, JNU, New Delhi, but then he retired. Currently, he is the editor of the Economic and uh, Political Weekly of India. He has, he has written numerous articles on various subjects relating to questions of equality, social justice, moral philosophy, such as the concept of humiliation and the self-respect and dignity, which have been published in national and international research journals. He has contributed several chapters and co-edited books like Atropy of Dalit Politics, 1996, Humiliation, Claim and Context, 2009, he has also co-authored, as I just said, two books with Professor Harukai. Now I request all of you again, because it has to be requested twice at least, to switch off your mobiles, please. And I invite Professor Harukai to deliver his lecture. Thank you, Sri Mutwan Sate. Um, it's a great honor and pleasure to be here with all of you. I have had the opportunity to <coughs> meet uh, Professor Ram Bapat once. I think it was also the time in which uh, Mutwan Sate and Gopal and others were there. This was at the theatre seminar at uh, Nina Samin Hegodu, which is a very central theatre institute in Karnataka. And, um, <coughs> More importantly, I have met so many people, um, people who have been influenced by Professor Bapat in many disciplines. It's not just in political science. And uh, it was always a matter of great pride and curiosity for me because 
um, you know, in today's world in which education is so conflicted, it is really wonderful to see a person like him who was very generous with his intellect, very generous in helping, helping is, is not the right word here, in working with a wide variety of people to do the kind of things they were doing. So we've been talking about that and I think it's a great honor um, that I'm at this moment at least standing on behalf and talking as a memorial uh, lecture to him. Um, it's also of course a great pleasure to be in the midst of uh, Gopal Guru whom I see as a naturally born guru for me and in all our work he's been a great guide and mentor. So um, it's a very daunting event to talk about Professor Bhapat, I mean in the context of his memorial and in the midst of uh, Professor Gopal. I must uh, particularly thank Makran, Gajan and, and the organizers this wonderful warmth and hospitality, um, you know, in organizing this particular event. I um, decided to speak on this topic on truth, politics, and theater for a variety of reasons. And to me, even though I did not know Professor Bapit personally, other than that one intervention, uh, I think today we are in a position at a time in India where it's extremely important to not just remember, but to learn to draw upon figures as models. The kind of crisis I think which we have confronted, not just in the political arena, the larger cultural space, but to me of great interest in the educational space, uh, the crises are such that it is no longer enough to just find our own path, struggle through it, which of course we are all doing to one level or the other, but also to find people who can inspire us, who can show us some, who can give us some hope and optimism that it is possible. So to me, what I present here today is in that spirit, is in that spirit of um, remembering Professor Bapat, not as a man who has passed away, but as a figure who is a beacon for us in knowing how we are going to engage and intervene in the coming years to come, in the years to come. And I chose this topic, um, Truth, Politics and Theatre, also because of Professor Bapat's interest and also because it's very closely aligned to many of the questions I have myself been concerned with in my work over the last many years. The question about truth and politics is very clear. We know why we have to talk about it today. Because we know we are in the midst of a global crisis. And the global crisis is most famously, perhaps, captured in the phrase fake news. If there's no other phrase which has become so potent and so powerful, thanks to, of course, somebody like Trump, but it has expanded so much that I have seen people in ordinary conversation, when they finish, the, when they reach the limits of discussion, when they reach the limits of argument, do you invoke the idea of fake news? So to say that it is all fake, there's nothing more to talk about. It becomes a kind of a limit point for dialogue. So to me, as just thinking about the context of society today, I think one of the greatest challenges facing all of us is to reconceptualize the idea of truth. That's the exercise I'm doing. How do we rethink the idea of truth? You know, truth as a concept is, uh, is of course been much written about, much talked about. For philosophers, it's uh, kind of their breakfast cereal something which they really need because they can, they've written extensively about it. But I think the challenge for us in the public domain today is to really ask ourselves, what could this concept of truth really mean for us today in this context? In other words, how can we deploy the idea of truth? Because every concept which is given to us does some work for us. When I want to use the word, for example, um, humiliation or an idea of oppression or an idea of rights or an idea of justice, we create that concept in a social uh, sense in order for it to do some work for us. It, concepts do literally work for us to do certain things, to achieve certain things in using that concept, both linguistically and also in terms of social action, social practice. 
So how do we think of the idea of truth today in that it becomes meaningful to us in ways which can help us understand our contemporary everyday life, in ways in which it can take care of the concerns of different constituents. I don't want to speak for just one constituents of within a society or the other, but different constituents. Why should truth matter? And you could ask a very polemical question. Could, is it possible to imagine our intellectual world, our cognitive world, without the concept of truth? Let's say we just drop the word truth from our dictionaries tomorrow. What would the world look like? How, how does our conversation look like? So I think I want, therefore I want to spend this um, reflective time with, with the generosity of all of you here to just reflect on what could the idea of truth actually mean for us today? How could we even think of reconceptualizing this idea of truth? And why today? Because as I said, it's not just fake news. I mean, the fake news has been so powerful in spreading its tentacles across that we have moved from fake news to fake entertainment to fake academics with all, uh, with all uh, you know, uh, apologies to all my academic friends. Uh, I'm, I'm saying, huh? Yeah. So I'm sure Gopal has something to say about it. And more worryingly, fake education. If there is one even thing which is happening in India today, the question of fake education has become so deep. And I mean by fake education, I don't mean literally the fake degrees that you get. Not even literally the fact that you can pay huge amount of money and get whatever degrees you want, including PhD. That's known, that's part of what we have read in the papers. I'm talking about fake education in that the very idea of what is true education has been lost. So it's not, forget about getting those degrees. If you set up good programs in universities today and educational institutions, and you ask somebody, what does education mean? Why am I going to class? What, am, what do you expect me to learn from the class? And as a teacher, if I ask myself, what do you expect me to teach you? How do you expect me to teach you? That reflection on what education is, is completely lacking. As much, you know, I'm sure the new national education policy report, all of you have opinions about it, I'm sure. It's been much discussed and there are, I think, important points in it. But there are also very deeply troubling points. There is a larger vision of education which it tries to encompass from school to the higher education. But still, in the public domain, that notion of the public, which was so important to Professor Bapati said and very important to me, in the notion of the public, that is in our conversations with all of us, not as specialists, but as just ordinary citizens of the society, what does education mean to us? And by saying there is something called fake education, I'm not trying to add a value to as if there is something called true education that I know what it is or that education is know what it is. I'm not even talking about that. I'm talking about the reflection. How do we ask the question of what should education be like in today's world given the kind of changes around us. So there are a lot of fake things around us, including fake theater, in the sense, I mean fake theater in the sense of TV serials, which all my theater friends, uh, if there's one point of agreement among all of them, if they don't agree too much on many other things, it is that TV serials are the most terrible things. You know, Akshara, the famous director, writer in uh, Canada, who, Francis Nina, some this theater institute is talking about, once equated TV serials with atom bombs. So they're as destructive to society as atom bombs are. So in this world of fakery and fakeness, what does it mean to think of truth? And I'm going to use politics and theater as two points to think about it. But first, I want to begin with a very uh, simple reason why today there are two powerful reasons of why this becomes more important to reconceptualizing truth. One is that, you know, truth has now been caught between two ends, the very concept of truth. One is anything goes. Earlier, very famously made as a post slogan of postmodernism. And while I think there are very important, these are very important movements who have done very important things in our intellectual history, the idea that anything goes seems to have liberated the idea of facts and truth from 
very specific doctrines or very specific grounding in certain things. So in a sense, anything goes as a slogan could mean that uh, has been very wrongly, in my view, misrepresented to say, you have your truth and I have my truth. And if once you reduce truth to saying it's your truth and my truth, what you say is your truth, what I say is my truth, and we can all live happily ever after, which is never going to happen, because that is the nature of yours and my truth, then it seems as if we have diluted the very idea of the idea of truth. You don't need the word truth to do this job. You can say your belief and my belief and let it go at that. You say you have your opinion and my opinion and let it go at that. To invoke that and add that value called truth to it does not seem to really make much sense. On the other hand, at the other extreme, where truth has been mortgaged to the fight between these two from anything goes to ideology. Ideology of various kinds, religious, political, social ideologies, which have to struggle with the notions of a truth which is outside their ideology. What do you do with the notion of truth which is outside their ideology? How does the ideology handle it? Just like how does anything goes handle it? And when truth has been mortgaged between these two ends, then how do we rethink this question of truth? And the two important reasons which today's world we need to really rethink it more seriously are these. I'm just using these two as things which concern me, you could add many other points to this. The first is the role of technology. Role of technology in the conceptualization of truth. I'm not talking about role of technology and its impact on society. In just the conceptualization of truth. In other words, how is truth possible in the world in the times of WhatsApp? You know, just three days back, uh, when just before I left Bangalore, um, one of my friends, he had come home and he told me, did you see the news about a very well-known Kannada actor who had apparently passed away and it was in WhatsApp. And in response to that news, and it had already spread enormously, and so this actor posts, he, he was not dead, and it was just a rumor or whatever, he sends a frantic message saying, I'm not dead. And because he thinks people may not believe him, he takes a video of himself saying, I'm not dead, look, I am alive. But you know the irony of this? Even that is not proof that he's alive. With this kind of technology that we have, there is no proof that we are actually alive. When you are within that media, you don't need to be, in fact, you don't even need to be that person to say, oh, no, no, I'm alive, look at me, look at me. It is... And, and this is just as an example of what's happening to us in this technological world. But if you see the kind of technological modifications of the notion of the real, it is directly correlated to the instability of the, of the concept of truth. And there is something which is interesting to remember that very often when we mean truth, we don't mean nothing more than the real, which in Indian language, language, language context is what it stands for. Truth is... Uh, satya and related to Sat. It is about existence. It's about what is there. So, for example, I, I don't use, invoke in ordinary language, I don't use the word truth to describe, if I say, oh, I am here in front of you, I will not re-express that sentence to say, it is true that I am here in front of you. I don't need to invoke that truth. It does not add anything once you recognize the notion of that something is there. So, in the case of technology, because of its manipulation of the real to such a deep context, there is also a strong tension with the conceptualization of truth, which is available to such a technological world. That's one, uh, one uh, part of the problem. And the second problem is um, today's politics, today's global politics. We have all been reading about the so-called rise of the right in all societies in, around the world with great exceptions, I think, like New Zealand, um, which we have been hearing recently about. But in this global politics, and what the, the most important challenge in the global politics today, as exemplified this, by this idea of fake news, and exemplified by fear-mongering of all kinds, of all notions of minorities and the marginalized and the poor, and we'll have to ask really this question, why is this happening? 
And in all this kind of global uh, politics which is happening, it is the idea of truth that is at which is being challenged in its most essential core. Because in this sense, in um, when truth is lost in such a discourse, then what you really lose are the fundamental ideas of democracy. So to me, the concern about truth here is not in terms of discovering or holding on to certain kinds of truths, but in actually reflecting on a very specific notion of democracy, which I'll uh, explain uh, later, in a sense, to use um, a very important Gandhian idea about um, truth, you can paraphrase it almost very similar to what he says, truth is the force against power. Truth is the only force against power. And if you lose that idea of truth, then you have a very fundamental problem in engaging with the question of power, which in global political scenario today, is seems to be the central problem, which we all have to confront. So how do we then recapture the question of truth in this world of technological anti-democratic tendencies around the world? In one line, that would be a kind of a challenge which we have in front of us. So this would be enough to say, okay, then therefore let's accept truth. But if you want a moment of philosophical reflection on this, we would begin with a much more simpler question. So assuming that what I say is correct and you can agree with it in part, then the next question would be, what is this idea of truth that I'm talking about? Where does this idea of truth really come from? And what do I act, what can I actually mean by saying truth without hiding behind doctrines or some very complex philosophical and social theories? What is truth to all of us in this larger sense of a public discourse? Because um, as I said, we rarely use it in our daily lives. If you can really tape yourselves in your everyday life unconsciously and then play it back, you would very rarely use the word truth. But it doesn't mean that truth is not at the back of many of the things we participate in. But truth gets exemplified, it comes to the surface, it gets presenced in certain particular contexts. And in those contexts, you go back to this concept of truth in order to help you understand and deal with those con contexts. One of the most important contexts is, for example, so we invoke the concept of truth when there, is a, when there is a sense of doubt. So whenever there is a doubt, whether it could mean, it could be a very deep doubt whether I'm really standing here or not, or it could be a simple doubt as whether um, the dish I had for lunch is pitla or zanka, uh, no, sorry. Uh, Zunka, Zunka. Um, I promised myself I wouldn't forget it, but I got confused. Pitla or Zunka. You know, those are doubts. And then when you are in that doubt, you can ask somebody to resolve that doubt. And when you ask somebody to resolve that doubt, you can use, you tend to use a concept called truth. You build it like a crutch in order to enable you to answer that particular question. If you have a doubt that uh, a shape in front of me is whether a man or a tree, a very famous example from philo Indian philosophical traditions, then I could say, well, no, no, it's true that it's actually a tree and it's not a man, it looks like a man. So, you know, those kind of contexts make you invoke the idea of truth, makes it seem as if it's necessary to have an idea of truth. So I'm giving you this example to say why we need the concept of truth at all before we ask what it is. The second time, uh, the, the second example which you use is when there's disagreement. So doubt is very different from disagreement. Doubt can be personal. I mean, it could be individual with yourself. Disagreement is when I'm saying something and somebody says no. And typically when we, you see that the limits of debate and discussion is going to come and you say, no, no, it is true, that's what it is. So political debates are characterized by deep disagreements. And the only way in which we can resolve disagreements or people tend to resolve disagreements is by invoking an idea of truth, which will then ground one position as against the other. So it allows you to reach a kind of a certainty in disputes, in disagreements between people and to ground that disagreement and in favor of one person or the other, you invoke a notion of truth. And that is typical, now I'm talking about this as our daily everyday talk. We will tend to use a truth, the idea of truth and you'll say, no, for example, many arguments which will end by something like this, say, no, 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 that is the way it is. 
And that's all there is to it. There is no more discussion beyond the point when you both hold on to certain notions of truth. And that's uh, I mean, this is an example of where how the question of truth uh, comes about. The third thing which in which a large variety, uh, multiple kinds of the ideas of truth comes about is when we talk about the non-visible, when we talk about things which are not apparent to all of us. And there it's not, so as I said, when I'm seeing all of you, I might say, oh, I'm seeing all these people in front of me and I might not add the other phrase. It is true that I'm seeing all of you because I assume that what I see is what is true. But if I'm told that this table is made up of atoms, and none of us in this auditorium can see atoms, then it is not just doubt, it's a very different state than doubt or disagreement. For disagreements, you should know enough to say why you disagree, etc. It is a question about a different worldview. And I'm just giving the example of atoms as one worldview, which is very different, which somebody else sees the world in that particular manner. Let's say the scientific story of how this podium is, is that this is made up of atoms which doesn't appear to us in our normal perception. This is no different. This worldview of looking at this thing in a different way is no different from somebody who might look at this from a socio-political context and read it in that sense. They might read it in terms of the laborer who made this, the kind of uh, objects this is made, I mean the kind of wood um, uh, this has been used here, etc. That is their perspective. So different perspectives which are not available to all of us in common, are often grounded in the notion of truth. So scientific truth is extremely important because it allows you to ground, give you a, a grounding for making assertions about something which most of us have no way to participate in. It is not a truth that all of us can say we'll do an experiment and know what it is or that we'll all agree with what the scientists would say. A notion of truth grounds it in a very deep sense. And we should remember, for example, in the at least in the philosophical traditions of uh, Greek and the European, um, that the idea of truth is very deeply indebted to the idea of mathematics. Because truth is grounded, mathematical truths are your highest forms of truths, and which has very deep implications on theology, on the questions of truth of God. In the Indian philosophical context, you don't have the mathematics question playing such a big role. Uh, but the question of the, not the truth of God, the experience of God, and there are alternate conceptualizations of it, but that's, that's very similar to that question. And there the question of God is one who is, or, or like numbers or mathematical concepts, uh, these are entities which are not available to all of us in the same common manner. And therefore, you have to find ways to convince the other that it is, there is indeed such an entity which I am talking about. And to invoke that, you invoke this idea of truth. And as I said, mathematical truth has just played a deep influence on philosophical ideas of truth. Capture one important idea of truth, a very important idea of truth, which is that truth is something which is eternal and unchanging. And this is, I think, a very deep philosophical problem which infects uh, traditions which look at truth through mathematics. Because the idea is that if you have 2 plus 2 is 4, that's not a statement which is true in 2019 or was true in 1918. It's true, it was always true and it will always be true. It was true in Africa and it's true in Australia and um, Americas as much as it is in Pune. That notion of truth, the power of the truth comes from this deeply metaphysical love or desire for making sense of eternality and unchanging. And almost all philosophy is struggling with this question of change. I mean, I view an enormous amount of great philosophical traditions arising from making sense of change. How do you make sense of change? It could be a simple idea of change of an object moving from here to here or a, or a leaf which is green turning brown. That question of change needs any characterization of change, any talk of change seems to need some substratum of something which is unchanging. That idea of unchanging captures a very important idea of truth. And that has been very influential in a variety of ways. And therefore, when you have, uh, when, we, when each of us have a different perspective of the world, 
the question of truth is often invoked to emphasize our view of the world in order to convince you that my view of the world is right. So we can go beyond mathematics and science to understand how truth functions in our, in our, in our daily life in our daily interactions within our own family. At a particular point, I have a different view than a person, a member of my family, about things in the world. Then at some point, for example, let's say smartphones, we are often, we keep telling children it's so dangerous, you know, it affects you so badly and so on. And children obviously don't get it, and they don't believe it, they don't accept it. And at some point you invoke various strategies of truth in order to convince them that look, our worldview that these smartphones are not good for you uh, is something which you should also buy into. So that, uh, there the question of truth is that unchanging eternal um, entity which is present allows you to do this kind of coercion. So truth is very coercive. And Hannah Arendt, I think one of the, I'll come back to her on her view on politics and truth. Um, believes that truth has been very coercive in that argument she does make that point uh, I think she calls it the tyranny of truth and, and truth has been used in that sense but I'm saying in today's world there is a very different kind of a function which uh, which truth does and which we need to get hold of the second problem is that I mean these might be some of the general characteristics of why we need truth but the real problem is that there is no one truth which is available for you across all domains of human action. In fact, if you look at the questions of truth, ideas of truth, it seems to be the case that each of the domains that we engage with have different notions of truth. So the kind of questions of mathematical truth that I spoke about, this eternal unchanging statements of mathematical axioms or results or even unchanging nature of those objects, Something again which is very deeply influential of Western philosophy, the idea that mathematical objects have an independent existence, numbers exist on their own and they are eternal and unchanging. You know, that kind of a worldview which is completely missing in Indian philosophical traditions uh, and that's a very different story altogether, a very fascinating story. The idea of truth in mathematics uh, is very different even from the idea of truth in the sciences. Although they are much closer to each other in terms of science-mathematics relation, an idea of truth in science is not as eternal and as unchanging as mathematical truths are seen to be. In fact, the strength of scientific knowledge lies in the scientist's own understanding that scientific truth is fallible, what they call as fallible. It is modifiable, it is changeable, and you are moving on to different notions of truths of the world in their accounts. But that's a constant progress, if you like, of some kind. They are not like mathematical truths which are a very different kind of creature altogether. So even within mathematics and sciences, there's a different notions of what kind of a truth they are. And within sciences, if you come to biology, the kinds of truths within biology, quote unquote, truths within biology, are quite fundamentally different from the kind of so-called truths of the physical sciences. A very classic example from philosophy of science is the notions of laws of nature which are very important and laws define what nature I mean, natures are etc and they are very different from biological laws like evolution so each of these domains are very different the notion of truth in engineering is very different notion of truth in human interaction notion of truth in philosophy um, you know the kind of questions which philosophy wants to ask is very different and all, therefore also the kind of notions of truth that arise in politics and art which you can add, therefore anticipate, are quite different. And I want to look at that particular juncture between politics and art and ask this question, if these ideas of truth are so different across these domains, what is it that characterizes, which to me as an important element of truth in politics and in theater? And um, see what, uh, you know, what the relationship between them is. So the point, the final point I'll make before I come to the question of politics is this. So if you ask the question, well, I think I now know where why truth occurs and maybe I have some little idea of how truth differs in different domains. Then the question is, how do you then arrive at truth? What is this question? How does truth appear to me? In spite of many traditions which have accounts of insights and eureka moments of truth, and they're not really truth in the classical sense of the word, 
they are just insights which then get converted to truth through a particular methodological process. It is not, you may have individual moments where it's insight and moments of self-knowledge about truth. But in principle, truth has always been associated with particular methods and practices. So the notions of method which functions in different uh, disciplines are often methods to get at it. So there are, if I want to get at truth, it's not always obvious in whether it's very, in, very deeply personal truths like in let's say spiritual experiences or very common public notions of uh, claims of truth like in any public uh, activity including science. There are very important constraining conditions on it. And I'll give you one example in the end about Gandhi to get an idea of what that, um, what the relationship is. So among the methods which I want to highlight, because which I'll use in my politics and truth, is that one, you need a particular way, a method, some way you can know how to reach that thing called truth. And in that, the notion of critique is extremely important. There is absolutely no notion of attempts at truth including deep inward inner truths of um, spiritual knowledge which has not been put under critique and the notion of critique in a very i'm using it in a loose sense here is extremely important for any methodological move towards the idea of truth and whenever you have truth which is public which is debatable which is a way to convince others of my worldview then it is always associated with forms of debate and we should remember that philosophy you know, in the very fundamental sense of the term arises as a form of debate. It's only debates which lead to notions of philosophy. And therefore, when today in uh, India, when there's been such an onslaught um, against social science and humanities and particularly philosophy, we often come back to the question of why philosophy is so important for any notion of the public to happen because philosophy allows you possibilities of public debate, norms of debate rules of debate and I think some of the best examples if you want to see of the complexity of what debate means rather than just saying debate is not Arnab Goswami debate. To go away from that and look at the complexity and the richness of the concept of debate, all you have to look at is Indian philosophical traditions and the way in which these traditions have grown up entirely through rules of debate, not just some saying I agree and you, this is my view and that's your view, but actually on normative rules. Uh, very specific typologies and categories which make debate as a public uh, commun uh, communion possible. And that's an extremely important part, I think, of any discourse on truth, any method to reach towards truth. And finally, a point which I won't talk about here, but I should mention this because it's extremely important part of any attempt towards reaching the truth, which is the problem of language. And this is so deep and so serious that um, you know, many times, uh, well, let me give you an example. We already looked at the example of truth in mathematics as a very high form of ideal. And when science begins to get formed, you know, people have often been asking the question, why should science, mathematics matter to science? And that's a very interesting question. I'm sure many of you who have done science might have hopefully thought about it. And uh, for, in philosophy, it's a, I think a very deep, a uh, lot of interesting work is there in this in this about this point uh, because you know mathematics is not about the na our world natural world it's about some eternal in some entities two three four and you make some brackets and matrices and do something why is it so indispensable to this world why is physics not possible without mathematics why should this kind of a description of the world matter to how two bodies will attract each other how two objects will relate to each other that is a question which is famously voiced by a very famous Nobel Prize winner, uh, Eugene Wigner, in the early uh, 20th century. He coins the phrase, the unreasonable effectiveness of mathematics. By that he means, mathematics should not work so well, but why is it that without mathematics there is no possibility of physics and therefore the other sciences? And it's a very interesting discussion on what is unreasonably effective. What I'm, why I'm pointing this out here is that Every, every domain, every subject and every philosophical tradition has understood that you need to do something to language if you want to attain truth. 
that language itself has to be modified and do things to it in order to reach truth. So language is a method which takes you to the truth. And in the context of the hard physical sciences, mathematics becomes a language which expresses the truth. And in the context of social sciences, we have these very difficult papers which get published in APW. And very often when we do writing courses for, no, not after Gopal, I said before pre-Gopal time, you know. Uh, if people often ask me to do writing courses for these uh, PhD students and so on. So why is social science writing so difficult? Why do they write it in such a way that they can't understand? I mean, and we have been very much attacked on philosophical writing by many people who say, why do philosophy people write like this? That do they really understand what they are writing? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know. And I think part of the debate on the public um, notion of um, you know engagement with these disciplines is also our own struggle with language. One way in which we make sense of it is that language itself, this is a very, very important point related to truth, language itself is intrinsically deceptive. Okay, if I don't want to say something as rude about language as that, we can say language in itself is neutral about truth. It doesn't really care. And that is true also with mathematics. And that's something, that's why the unreasonable effectiveness comes. Because I can use the same mathematics to describe the so-called truth of this yeah, physical system. And I can use that same mathematics to describe exactly the opposite of that system. Very often, for those of you who have done this, you know, you re realize this and it's such a, I think it's a kind of a magic about the question of language and reality. By just changing a sign from plus to minus, it describes a completely different world. For example, a world which is defined when, ob when I drop an object, it falls to the ground. I can do all physics with that. And then I do the, and the mathematics, I keep the same mathematics, I just change the plus to minus sign. It describes a world which when I drop a stone, it will go up. I mean, it, mathematics seems to be indifferent to the nature of our world. Any of our languages, seems to be indifferent to our world. And this is where the greatest challenge from the question of why the languages we speak in a culture matter. Because if there is an intrinsic relationship between language and your experience, and your cultural experiences, then language is not just another description of your experience. There is something naturally connected to them, then you cannot do this. But when we use different languages to talk and describe the world, language is actually quite indifferent, whether you're lying or you're speaking the truth. Language by itself doesn't have the capacity to say, this is truth and I'm showing it to you just because I say it. Okay, there's just one, there is a, there's also very wonderful ideas from Indian philosophy of language, particularly the grammarians and Ratrahari, which will give you a different approach, which I think is fascinating, but I won't go into it here. But I'm just saying that the question of language and its relation to truth is extremely important in this sense. So, uh, it's not easy, therefore, I'm giving you all these examples to say it's not just easy to get at truth anyway. It can be in any discipline, whether it's in politics, theater, or anything else. To get at the notion of truth is needs some particular kind of work, training, manipulation of various kinds of things, and so, and so on. But the biggest problem so far with the idea of truth, which therefore leads to postmodern critiques of truth and sometimes valid critiques is that because truth has been associated with these kinds of method and competences and skills and so on, they've often been used as a form of control and hegemony. And truth has always had forms of hegemony. I mean, if you look at cultural hegemony, for example, very often they are encoded through truths. For example, the so-called today in today's world, the invocation of Shastric support for cultural actions or social actions are nothing but another way of saying the truths encoded in this Shastric domain, therefore ground these kinds of actions that I do. So there is a problem with the idea in which, in which and this is in some sense what Hannah Arendt is talking about, the tyranny of, possible tyranny of truth and what it can do. In the context of what I'm going to speak about on politics and democracy, there is a bigger problem. And this bigger problem is, who among us can actually decide whether something is true or not? What do we need as public participants in a society? So-called quote-unquote ordinary citizens. 
in our everyday world. What is it that we need to have? What capacity do we need to have in order to be able to judge something is true or not? You know, in the case of science, it's very clear. If somebody is telling you that there are things called quarks, and we might say, okay, you say quarks, we'll all accept it, we'll teach our children that you have textbooks on it, books on it, you give Nobel prizes for that also. Because we, none of us, is, it's, it's, not a, it's not a matter of adjudication for the public citizenship. Because we'll say, no, I don't know how you come across, you say you've done all this, you've spent billions of dollars to build that machine and you're, you know, you're all very smart and all that and we're all really social scientists, so it's okay. So you know what it is and we agree with it. But, you know, you don't have a way of adjudicating it. And a large amount of truth in many different domains are like that. So the authority comes because of the inability of the public, a larger notion of a democratic public who can participate in saying, yeah, this is true, this is not true. For the following reasons, I think it's true and not true. So the f I'm saying this because I'm, I'm, I'm saying what I'm going to end with. So I want to say it as a phrase, then come back and show you how that, why I say it. The notions of truth in politics and art are fundamentally different from the ideas of truth in the other domains like philosophy or sciences or mathematics because there is a space in which the public citizenry has to take a call on the idea of truth. If I hear somebody saying, oh, this is the, you know, which is, we have been fighting about this for quite some time now, you know, with all this um, hate politics in the country now, um, on let's say the Muslim growth rate, etc then you have to have a form of citizenship where we can all be able to talk about it and come to a judgment on it because everybody is anyway sitting on judgment on it and saying no no it is true that it is that and you i have no clue what they mean by it is true that it is that so what is why that and none of us are discuss, discussing about this in the same manner about you know dna and genes and quarks and atoms and so on so in both in, and, and, and the argument I'm going to make is both in theater and politics, a very similar account of putting the burden of deciding on truth on people, on individuals rather than on communities. And that changes the complete stake of what truth, how truth functions in politics and art. And I'm talking particularly about theater. So let me begin with politics and art for a few minutes and then show its contrast with theater. Um, you know, people I think have been uh, very clear about what politicians do and who they are. And I was very surprised that there are actually people who do research project on this. So there is a Pew Research report in 2015, um, went and asked people, who do you trust more? And the lowest percentage were for politicians for honesty. This is you know, these are global so-called testing people and asking what they think. So lowest percentage of politicians for honesty compared to even business people. And they say they even see market as being more truthful than politicians. And th this is international uh, numbers. In another survey in 2012, they did a comparative thing in US, UK and India. And 72% uh, in these three countries agreed that truth is hard to find in politics these days. And when they gave a list of 10, uh, you know, to rank people in terms of being truthful, in all of them, politicians as a group came last. So, for example, in the US, the doctors were first and politicians were last. But very uh, ironically, religious leaders were second there. I don't know why. And uh, lawyers generally come also very low, um, with due apologies to lawyers here. Uh, in the UK, very surprisingly, again, doctors come first and military is second, politicians are last and car salesmen particularly have been targeted for second last least truthful people, uh, which is very true, I think. Uh, and in India, doctors again come first and very surprisingly, journalists come second for being most truthful, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, and uh, after lawyers, which is in eighth position, car salesmen tie with politicians for the least truthful people. 
so the, in all these places there seem to be a very general agreement that yeah politicians lie but is it what is really the relationship between politics and truth i mean is it as simple as that saying politicians lie have we understood what politics is before we understand that politicians lie that politicians are not doing what we are doing in our daily lives and whatever it is that they do what is that relationship to their action of politics to the question of truth and lies that's the question you should be asking and a very good entry into this is by this um, a very important philosopher which i'm sure many of you have read hanna arent uh, who wrote this very powerful report on the eichmann report when she reports on this um, trial against adolf eichmann who um, killed many of the jews as a uh, as a who was running a uh, he was running a concentration camp and after she wrote the series of reports which the new yorker published she was actually quite attacked because she coined a very important phrase called banality of evil and because she was saying look here was this guy who killed thousands tens of thousands of people and when she went and saw him in this when she was reporting on his uh, trial there's a very wonderful story i don't know if you have read about it eichmann was uh, abducted by the mozart the israeli secret force brought to jerusalem he kept on a public trial so people could know what kind of a guy he is and she saw him and found was very disappointed he was not evil at all he was like an ordinary man like each one of us and that was her great fear that evil doesn't come out and show its presence as evil it is in its very ordinariness that evil resides and the ordinariness of this adolf eichmann she thought lay in his being a bureaucrat his bureaucratic mind which is related later on to unthinking following of rules which didn't bother him at all meant that evil appears in these forms i mean these are very important lessons for today's society in india okay and how something happens and how it doesn't affect many of us in our daily lives because it happens and it could go as a bureaucrat i mean adolf eichmann was like that and when she saw him and wrote about it and said it's so banal she was actually very strongly criticized because they thought as a jew who escaped germany she should have not negated the seriousness of it all like in the sense by presenting it as an another ordinary thing a banal thing she was missing out on the the terrible atrocities that he committed and nazism what nazism stood for but very interestingly in response to all this because she was attacked so much she wrote on another essay called truth and politics which was published in 1967 again in the new yorker um because she was responding to the charges of lies against her lies about what she wrote etc and in the truth and politics she begins with this statement uh, no one has ever doubted that truth and politics are on rather bad terms with each other and no one as far as i know has ever counted truthfulness among the political virtues lies have always been regarded as necessary and justifiable tools not only of the politicians or the demagogues but also of the statement straight is it of the very essence of truth to be impotent and of the very essence of power to be deceitful this is the question she phrases in the context of politics and truth because if the and for her as you can see essence of power politics is about essence of power and that the very essence of power is to be deceitful and the very essence of truth is important this is a very startling claim about political truth so i mean as i said we need to distinguish between the different kinds of truths in each domain and to understand the nature of truth in politics we need to know what is it that truth does or what what is it that politics does and if politics is about holding power exerting power and not giving up power which is what we see politics today in our electoral politics then the very essence of it is deceit that's something which we might at first instance accept and say as, as all these uh, um, you know uh, the surveys of people are saying politicians are the most uh, false but uh, we have to go a little bit beyond that and that's what i want to try and do here i want to try and show you what is it about politics that should concern us as far as truth is concerned is it as simple as saying all politics is just about deceit holding on to power at whatever cost because we have models of 
power and whether it's translated as political power is different and Gopal can tell us more about it. Uh, models of power in the way in which uh, uh, Gandhi and Ambedkar look at it and their response to it. And I'll end with that little bit um, so that we connect these points together. So I'll just give you some quick responses for us to be able to think about what politics could be. Suppose we accept that she's right and all the survey is right and we think politicians lie because that's their quote unquote dharma. Okay. Now I my first response to it would be to say there is no problem even if politics is about lies. You know for me Trump is not that much of a problem at all. He can say fake news for everything but I know for those things he says fake news that that is true. You know there is actually to me the actually larger interesting point of discussion which I'm not I'm not doing here today is actually not about truth it's actually about falsity about lies. Now, what, and this is very famously embodied in a very famous philosopher's um, the paradox in philosophy called the liar's paradox, which is whether the statement I am a liar can be true or not. Okay, so if I say I am a liar, then if I'm speaking the truth, I'm not a liar. If I'm speaking falsehood, then I am not a liar. So, that kind of internet, and you know, philosophers try to waste a lot of their time, and other people try <laughs> by doing this. But this is a very fascinating uh, point, by the way. So I'm just sorry about making fun of philosophy a bit, but you know, but that's a very interesting question. There are a lot of very wonderful discussions on this. But I'm saying for politics, lies are not as much a problem. In if I'm going to say a lie, and the other party is also going to say another lie, and the best example which I have seen in the last two three weeks is the drama in Karnataka. It's just so absurd, it's so surreal. It uh, beats any play you might write, Makari, you know, <laughs> because to imagine that needs a kind of a depraved, you know, imagination of a particular kind. Um, because, you know, if they are, if you know that they are going to be talking from the position of lies, you know how to engage with those lies. Not too much of a problem. But actually the politicians are not even doing that. If we think that politicians are actually doing lies as lies in order to deceive us, then they must be more foolish than any of us can imagine. And politicians are not foolish. If anything at all, if you do the top 10 list of most smart people, next to lawyers, it will be politicians, you know, because they are really smart. So what is it that they do when they do this? How do we understand the social process of one party saying, I mean, as you're saying, you know, Kumaraswamy saying something and Edurapa saying something quite contrary. I mean, as I said, it's so absurd. Somebody saying I paid money to buy the MLA, somebody said no. And, and then, you know, of course, as Gopal has written a wonderful uh, editorial in EPW, which will come out tomorrow, right, on defection, the idea of defection. But these are all the serious things which we look at, and they're all playing games. They're actually talking to each other. I wouldn't be surprised they're in the same resort and having dinner together. And this is a point about politicians. The questions of lies is not addressed to the internal action, but it's a question of lies is directed to us. It's a performance of lying is not for them. And Trump is a classic instance of it. When he is saying something, his performance of that is not to convince himself. He knows what he's saying is untrue. Because he li he really lies, right? I mean, <laughs> it's very difficult to lie like that blatantly. But he knows that. And so why am I lying? Not for my sake. I, it's not that I don't know. He knows that somebody else can check it. And with all these all these American uh, journalists standing and trying to catch them, they are all every day. These I feel sorry for this American journalism. Every day they are coming up with. You know, how many uh, false statements Trump made? I mean, you know, after some time, initially I was very surprised, oh, these people are doing this. Now I'm bored and I'm saying they should also be bored. Because it's just coming up every day. Today was 50 false statements he made. <laughs> and Trump is looking at it and he's going to be laughing. He's saying, I knew, I, I probably said 70 and today I've only done 50. Lies are not about the question of truth and lies. The performance of lies is something else. It is addressed to us and that's the function of politics which is 
it is not about what two scientists are disagreeing with what each one of them is saying about that theory or two mathematicians are describing or two social scientists they are actually putting that statement out so that the hearer all of us who hear this the large so called uh, what is that aam aadmi the aam aadmi has to make a judgment on whether if so there are let's say there are two politicians a and b and both are saying entirely contrary things to each other and the function of politics is to continue to say that to each other even though everybody is saying no no i have records which will show you are wrong it doesn't matter because there is a very important function that's the point of democratic politics because they are putting that for each one of us to make a judgment on who is saying the truth or false when each is accusing each other of falsehood so think of it let's flip the way we look at truth and lies in politics not worrying about whether they really mean it or that's really true or not but as a kind of a performance in which it says kumar swami knows very well what he is saying so part of it is true part as well edirappa knows that from his context and i am listening it's addressed to all of us all of us in the sense potential voters all of us were listening to it and they want us to make the judgment it's not the way truth is legitimized in any other domain it's not that two scientists are saying there are quarks and another person there are no quarks and leave it to all of you to decide because none of us have the capacity to decide the public doesn't have the capacity to decide but the difference is truths in politics truths as they arise in politics i'm not talking about political truths truths as they arise in politics are meant for negotiation between among us among all of us sitting in this room and we have to make a judgment they are least interested in making a judgment in science for example again i'm using it as a very important example because the question of truth is so important in science the scientific community will decide between these two scientists that's why you have journals which will review it somebody will publish it they'll critique it they'll modify it and do it here the community is us because we are the ones who make the politicians the politicians and we have to adjudicate and how are we going to adjudicate we decide to switch channels from times now to ndtv that's all we do we don't have adjudication you don't like to sometimes you just can't stand what one party is saying you don't see them at all you just they turn it off and i'm going to watch something else what so this is a extremely important point of politics i want to come back to it because it's as i said the central core of the idea of politics for me the question of politics is not really about politicians and governments it's really about each one of us democratic politics is about our action it's not about the action of the people whom we choose to govern and the way in which truth plays out the contestation of truth plays out is to put that that burden the second way of looking at it is to say well politics and truth well let's not worry too much about it because politics is not really about truth it doesn't really care too much about truth because you could say truth in politics is truth in effect and not in content that is truth in politics is truth of a particular action and not truth of what it says very often when we talk about truth we often say is are there eight planets in the solar system okay that's true um are there is the population of india 1.3 billion that's true you know those are content those are factual contents or it's propositional knowledge it's true that the sky is blue is that the kind you know that is one kind of truth but truth in politics is really not about that it's Uh, what i would call as truth in effect so political truth is not factual knowledge but it's about creating real effects it's about creating an effect so when kumar swami each time suddenly starts crying is you know, kumar swami is a very interesting i i am presuming all of you know who he is he was the chief minister of karnataka till two days back <laughs> you know and in many of his sudden discuss i mean you know the whole family is very interesting they go to revanna and call swami but whenever there are really deep uh, political discussion he starts crying on stage you know on tv so nobody has been able to uh, crack that um so the point for me is the truth in politics is not actually about truth of proposed factual content but it's about creating refer- real effects real effects as political effects in in a democratic society 
So the question of politics lies in the mechanism of moving from falsity of assertions to truthfulness of effect. So let me explain what I mean by that. Falsity of assertions doesn't matter. You can lie all you want. But from that lie, if I can win an election, that if election is a real result which puts me in power. The content to the falsity of the content is quite immaterial when compared to the truthfulness of effect. And this actually has a, a very deep, um, you know, implication for how we understand uh, politics properly. Another way of looking at it is to say political truth is like engineering truth. You know, truth in engineering is actually very interesting, although it seems so closely aligned to science. There's a fundamental divide between science and engineering, which is in science, the truth you discover in science, I mean, the truth in science are those which are discovered about nature. It's already present in nature. You're just discovering them. Truth in engineering are made. Engineering truth makes truth happen. They create truth. The truth about mobile or cell phones were not available at all till they were built. And once it's built, it is true. It's more true than any truth that you know. It's more powerfully true than any truth that you know. But this truth is truth which is created and citizen of our society owns the public in exactly the same amount. If you monetize a park, let's say, and say that park is worth one crore, then, and let's say you have one crore population in Pune, and let's assume they are the citizens. It's a very complex question of who is a citizen, especially today. <laughs> But what it means is that each of you own one rupee of that share of that park. That's the meaning of the public. We own equal rights to the value of anything notion of or called as a public. So we have to take care of my one rupee. So because all of us have one, one rupee invested in it, we all have to take control, control of it, but we don't do it. So the notion of politics is by voluntarily giving up my right to public wealth to the hands of a few who will govern it on my behalf. This therefore leads to the very important idea of trusteeship, you know, Gandhi, Tatas and others. That is, the idea is that the public is, each of us have an access, we all have a value in, in the value of the society, in the, in the public wealth. But since we don't operate it, we don't govern it individually, we vote a person to take care of our interests, so that the wealth of that park will keep growing up and we are all eventually going to share in that wealth. But we know that it has never happened in politics that way. In fact, all that public wealth has gone into private wealth of these politicians. But the implication of this is that, you know, we, the, the implication of democratic voting is I give up my right to govern and to public wealth by voting you into power. And in response, the politicians give us the right to judge what they say as true or not true. Okay, if it's a slightly complicated argument, we can talk about it later. What I'm trying to say is that if, if you want a um, phrase, it's my truth for your vote. So let me put it this way. There is an ethics of political truth. Any political truth in a democratic system, particularly electoral democracy, has an ethics involved with it, the ethics of political truth, which is that the legitimization of any kind in a democratic is, is itself made democratic. And democracy consists not just in voting a, a casting a vote. That's the simplest thing all of us can do. But it is actually lies in the more important act of evaluating truth claims. That's democracy. And that's why when you say scientific truths or mathematical truths, they cannot be made democratic. You cannot decide on a Nobel Prize in science by saying whether all of us think it's truthful or not. That is not the nature of that kind of truth. But what we mean by political notions of truth and political democracy is the capacity to believe that democracy is not just in casting vote, but in actually evaluating uh, truth claims. Therefore, we, very often we keep saying this, right, that uh, something is political. So especially you apply for a job and you don't get it, so oh, no, it's all politics. If you don't get published, it's politics. You know, if, politics is there everywhere. Everything is, we use the term, it's all politics. What do we actually mean by that? So 
I think one of the ways to understand something is, uh, to this is to say, we make something political when we raise the question of ethics to truth. It could be, for example, I should have been hired, I didn't get hired. I say, oh, it's all politics. What am I saying when I'm saying it's all politics? I'm not saying I have casted a vote, somebody cast a vote and we had elections. All I'm saying is that I raise the question of ethics to the notion of truth. What is the truth? Somebody will say, no, you're not qualified, you're not good enough for getting this job. And that's the basis on which I didn't take you. And when I say it's all politics, I'm actually raising the question of ethics to the idea of truth which grounds that action. I think to me, that is the very central core of what we could um, mean uh, by politics. Because uh, my final point therefore in this is, when truth becomes a public property, which is not the case in other specific domains, when truth becomes a public property, you have politics. <coughs> All our discussion on RTI, etc., it's exactly um, attempt to bring truth into the public. RTI is a classic example, and it's so sad what's happening here. So when you remove truth out of the Agrahara, it becomes politics. That is the way in which the notion of politics and truth function in the most fundamental sense. Okay, so I've given you the different domains and I've said two parts of my talk and I'll just, I won't take too long. Um, but it's always dangerous to tell philosophy teachers don't look at clock because you know, we go on talking. But my last section of this argument is about truth in theater. And I'm sure there are so many theater people here, and Makran and others are here, so I won't say too much about it because I'm sure you've all been talking a lot about it. I'll just begin with um, a very interesting, I mean, a very important playwright, uh, Harold Pinter, and his Nobel Prize, he was awarded the Nobel Prize in 2005, and he couldn't go to accept it, and I think he taped or sent his talk, I think this video taped his talk. And interestingly, his Nobel Prize lecture is titled Art, Truth and Politics. Okay, that, that lecture, his uh, Nobel acceptance lecture was basically a rant against the US and their, you know, intervention in South America, Middle East, etc. It's a very, very critical attack on US policies. But he begins by saying something very interesting, uh, which I'll read. Quote, the majority of the politicians on the evidence available to us are interested not in truth but in power and the maintenance of that power that we have seen. To maintain that power is essential that people remain in ignorance and they live in ignorance of the truth, even the truth of their own lies, their lives. What surrounds us therefore is a vast tapestry of lies upon which we feed. I mean it's very similar to what Hannah had already said and I'm sure all of us say this but that's not the interesting point because after that his long essay is actually about why truth is so important in theatre. After dismissing this question of truth in uh, politics, saying the politicians are all lies, he wants to recapture the question of truth in theatre by saying, no, there is something true about what I write and, and so on. And since it was very complicated, I didn't want to talk about it because I wanted to give you some other examples which I've engaged with with all my theatre engagement um, on this particular point. Sometime back, um, a theatre artist, her name is Vidya Hegde. She was trained in Ninasam and now she works at a community theatre there. Sent me a piece because she was very troubled by some question and she had written in Kannada and sent a very interesting piece on the question of truth in theatre. Okay, and she's in Hegodo, which is a very small village, Karnataka. And they are very active theatre public community, it's not the Nina some theatre institute. So the village people have a troupe and they keep performing and so on. And they're very professional about it. And she wrote this point by saying, she was writing her, giving her, uh, you know, experience of uh, certain uh, theatre things. And she said they had come to NCPA for some festival or something. And she said, I saw some um, street theatre in bus stops, etc. I think it was during the time of the Me Too or harassment things and she said you know they struck me what struck me about them was the sense of truth in their performance you know there is a kind of uh, a natural reality the notions of real some they're talking about a real issue they were doing it spontaneously in bus stands and other places and people had to respond to them there was a notion of truth present in that 
and what the kind of things which they do that troupe does a variety of plays a lot of greek plays mythological stories classical uh, drama kannada sanskrit etc so uh, then she says in her write up she says i came back to the thing and she said i was very troubled because i was beginning to think of why is truth so important to theater or is truth important to theater and then she says when i was acting one of my co i was telling one of my co actors you know there's something about truth in theater and he said how can that be everything that we do is such a fake false thing how can you talk about truth in theater and then she wrote a long response to why she thinks there is something essentially true about theater and this is a question which the most fruitful discussions i've had for all these years has been with very intense theater practitioners many of whom will not let go of the notion of truth within theater within the act of theater so i'm just saying i'm talking about theater here not as a third domain of the talk but i've said all this about politics because i wanted to connect them to what i'm saying about theater there's a very close relationship to the conceptualization of truth so when all these people are saying truth what could truth actually mean in theater where could the idea of truth arise in theatrical practice in this as i said with all the students at nina sam when we talk about this is the question they repeatedly come back there is a another well known um, um, theater director in canada and once we were talking about this and he said for him truth is the only core for him true idea of truth is the only measure by which he understands uh, you know uh, whether a rehearsal is worked whether his group is performing correctly or not and when i asked him really how do you want to talk about this truth he said i'm just paraphrasing him he said true theater is communion with shiva and when he meant shiva he is an atheist so he's not really talking about shiva you know doing all this stuff but it's about some no for him there is a fundamental principle of truth that only theater can capture which not even other activities could not capture for him and i also remember in our theater seminar where you it was a bapat everybody was there uh in my session i was speaking about i used the word i was actually talking about the idea of fake and one of these directors from tamil nadu he was so offended by it he came and said how can you use the word fake when you talk about truth and i was telling him no everything you do you know i, I was not saying that what they are doing is fake but we are talking about the notion of fakeness of what happens on theater and he felt tremendously um, you know insulted by the fact that we want to use a term like that to describe theater but having said this and if we are just watching theater you know whether we like it or not without offending too much theater practitioners you can begin with a simple proposition that theater is actually about falsity it's about falsity in a very true sense of the word it is obviously false it doesn't have to act false it presents itself as false it presents itself and you know when i think the best examples of using this discussion is using uh, you know because in nina san so much of discussion on this rama and sita because you know lot of yakshagana performances come on this etc and these are very radical performances also it's not like nice and ramayana which you see there you know all kinds of things happen with rama and sita there so we often use this point so we know that for example when a character comes as rama on stage that character is presenting complete falsehood quote and quote you know without let's not add value to falsity here like wrong bad etc not even attempt to deceive it's not an attempt to deceive it's falsity in presence falsity deceives when it is hidden when i want to deceive you i tell you it's a lie i'm trying to do something manipulated theater is transparent and in that sense it's very innocent this actor comes and says i am rama and we as act, viewers are also very innocent and say oh you you are rama and we watch what happens watching as if it's happening with rama and sita but when it presents itself through falsity unlike other things in in our lives we present ourselves through our truth or reality what we are and in when you present a description of the world you present it in its uh, thing and so when rama comes on stage and some people try various kinds of alienation techniques including i remember one show in which they take a mythological figure and put nike shoes and commando pants it utterly failed people are still seeing this rama there you know this guy is trying to say no i am not rama but i come as rama on stage and we are all saying oh it's rama 
what is that process of theater? What is it about theater that allows this thing to happen? You know, and what has been a great learning experience for me with these theater directors and actors is this, their very deep engagement with this question. And even as students, when they're getting trained, they're coming, well, what is it? Why do we actually succeed in what we do when we, even when we try not to do it? That's why I think for me, in a very true sense, even a partly meaningful theater is always successful. It's really difficult to do a really bad theater, which means it's really bad. I mean, if people are just walking out, you know, then you've really done something wrong. But I think there is something about theater which go, fits it out. But what theater in its falsity, in its appearance falsity is basically telling you is, it, it, the character is saying, you know, I'm not Rama, and yet I am Rama. You go figure it out. I'm not going to answer your questions of truth for you. It's the same as the political move on democracy. You go figure it out. The question of truth in theatre is not for me to present because I am presenting false. I am telling you I am Rama, but you know I am not Rama. But if that is a dilemma, it's your dilemma, not mine. You have to have a public discourse of truth and engagement of conversation about it in order to answer that question. That's an extreme. To me, theatre succeeds because of this. Because it does not pontificate about its own truth. It is not bothered about saying, oh, I am fake news. In fact, if they say I am fake news, we'll look at it as if it's true. You know, our engagement with theater truth, truth is so deep, we have to ask ourselves, not theater. What is it that makes? So some people will say, you know, suspension, will you all that stuff. I think those are, if they want, there's one way of doing it. To me, what is an interesting question is, you know, if the real Rama comes, then that's no longer theater. It becomes life. You don't want real drama to come because then you're not watching that. You've wasted money buying a ticket. You can watch real drama for free and you want him on stage, you better pay for it. That, you know, that flip is extremely important for any idea of theater to be possible. From There's a very important lesson from this and that's the lesson I want to draw from this, which is that false presentation is a necessary condition for attaining truth. Truth and falsity is not a kind of a tension which say, oh, this is true, this is false. The method, one of the very important methods to reach towards truth is through this obviously self-consciously presentation of falsity as a method to reach at some very fundamental notion of truth, which is present in theater in all forms of ways. The false presentation as condition for truth actually happens in very different ways. Um, I, I won't say this because it will go on much longer than what I want to do, but it's actually a very important method for truth. So when the unreasonable effectiveness of question math mathematics comes, it's actually a rephrasing of this question. Why is it that I need the domain of unreal entities of mathematics in order to get the truth of the physical world? It's a very similar, uh, you know, question of language within, I mean, of presentation of ontology within mathematics and theater, but that's a different story altogether. So the problem is, why does theater want to do this then in some sense? Okay, I'm saying all this as if I know all this, I'm most probably wrong in all what I'm saying, but I'm just reflecting aloud with all of you on this because as a public discourse, I want to do that rather than thinking I'm doing some specialized discourse here. Because the problem with the idea of the real and truth, which is contrary to theater, is that once you're in its grip, you cannot see anything else. There's a real problem about the idea of the real. Because truth makes us consent immediately, whereas falsity makes us dissent. We disagree only when you know that something is wrong. When you accept the world of truth, the notions of critique and question is a completely different kind of a, a, a engagement with it. <coughs> and therefore, when theater is effective, because it uses falsity as a method. I'll give you another example of the Nina Sam story. You know, this uh, one of these performances they did in a small village. They go around in all villages and perform uh, for one and a half months. They're a professional troupe. In one of the places they were staying, and one of the actors wrote this mail to Akshara, which he then forwarded to me. He writes this, this actor who plays Rama in, in one of those places. It's a very uh, radical contemporary reading of it. Um, um, and he acts as, they are staying in a small place in this village, and there's an old woman who runs the mess. So he and his uh, co-actors are all eating in that mess. And he says she was like my grandmother, very loving and, and affectionate towards him. <clears throat> then the day of the performance came. She came to the performance and next after the performance he goes to eat there 
you know, and this is what he writes. He says, she's so angry at me, she doesn't serve me. She's really angry and upset at me. He's gone, he's removed all his, there's not much of, you know, Vesha and all that stuff. He, because she knows that boy whom she was serving till yesterday has come back to her for food. She still sees him as Rama, who has done this terrible thing to Sita. So when the Sita's actress comes, she's very nice and you know, takes care of her as if something has happened to her. And she refuses to deal with this guy. And he is writing this in puzzlement and also great joy. You know, he doesn't mind being this, but he says, what is it? I mean, I think if we negate that point by saying, no, no, people are very foolish, they don't understand, they are, you know, etc. I think we miss a very important part of theatre. Okay. So the crucial point I'm trying to say from this, and I'll just conclude with this in two minutes, five minutes, is this. Truth in theatre is actually a different kind of truth than truth in other domains. One, truth in theatre arises as truth as experience, which is very different from truth as cognition, truth as quote unquote rationalization, that is making set of arguments coming to a conclusion. Truth as experience and secondly and more important point for me is that it is presence truth as action, not truth as uh, what we call as propositional statements, that is st factual statements about the world. Truth in theatre is about truth about action, truth as action and one of the best ways in which we can understand the question of truth as action is through Gandhi. And after Gopal Guru's wonderful piece, which I hope many of you have read in EPW a few years back, two years back, is it? On um, um, which year was it? Gopal, do you remember? Yeah, it is, yeah, 2017, just two years back, Ethics in Ambedkar's Critique of Gandhi is another classic instance of how two of the great thinkers who thought, who thought about politics in a very deep sense, and they both thought of truth as action. So when you look at the question, so I'm saying, I'll, I'll just give you very quickly the example from Gandhi, of course, we know well. Um, for Gandhi, truth is the most important um, conceptual term by which many other things work with. Questions of love and ahimsa are come, come back to the question of truth. But for truth, well, I'll give you just one illustration. He's written a lot of sporadic stuff on truth, including scientific truth and so on. But one point he talks about this voice of truth, the inner conscience. And the inner conscience, uh, he goes to great extent to say how inner conscience is not just having my own thoughts, it's different from one's beliefs and thoughts. You have to get trained to be ready to know what is an inner conscience. That is the voice of truth does not come, whatever I hear is not a voice of truth. I may have a lot of terms saying, no, let me go have Vada Pao today afternoon, that's not a voice of truth. Voice of truth comes as a call to action after certain preparation and Gandhi being Gandhi, he gives you very tough preparations including uh, celibacy, absolute humility, you know, uh, chastity, adopt poverty, only speaking truth and so on. It is that preparation of training yourself to be able to listen to the voice of truth when it speaks to you and it will speak to each one of us if you are trained enough to hear it, just like a musician has to be trained enough to hear the correct notes. We have to train ourselves in order to be able to hear the voice of truth within us. Truth is a method but it is available to us internally and that truth is not truth for writing a paper and sending it to EPW. That truth is a truth for, sorry uh, Gopal, uh, you know, it's not about EPW. But you know, we are in such a situation in the country that the best, only journal in social science as well, one of the most important journals is only EPW and there are so many people trying to you know, so many voices in social sciences in the country, anyway. So the point is, it's not just about getting that inner voice, but truth only comes into being when it is acted upon. That's, I think, a very important, profound principle of the idea of truth. So truth is not about comparing something and saying, oh, that's true, that's false. It's not about saying there are 10 bulbs in this room and not. That's not about the question of truth. The question about truth is its very intrinsic association with action under certain kinds of uh, practice. So conscience leads to an action which is true and I think this is a really remarkable thing which happens with Ambedkar and Gandhi that we often associate truth with facts what we call as propositional knowledge and stuff right but Gandhi is associating the word truth to action and we only when we talk of action in our normal life 
we don't use the word true we'll say correct or false did i do the correct action did i correctly do it you know if i'm going to play cricket is the action correct you know did i hit the ball correctly or not but to incorporate the idea of truth and connect it to action is a very remarkable principle but it's based on the fact that any path to action i mean truth cannot truth is too important to be just reduced to a certain set of statements or rational rationalizations of various kinds but it has to be performed in a very important sense and uh, therefore the truth as action breaks the difference between belief and action so i might say all good things about let's say gender but i might all act in, you know this is a con this is a very important problem about ethics right um, and also problem about what lot of philosophical position on ethics uh, you might say about all universality and stuff like kant did and yet you could be have very racist opinions about it for right? saying the black guys can't think and women can't rationalize for example or that one might you know we might say i believe in gender equality and in all my actions do exactly the opposite so for gandhi that's not a question about what is whether i am having true belief and stuff that doesn't function at all because uh, truth as action breaks a difference between belief and action breaks a difference between theory and practice and um the, since that is uh, something very important so for him in through this human truth appears and is not found like truth happen that's a very different formulation of what truth is and this is the truth of politics and this is also the truth of theater that we find and there's a very interesting coming together of the notions of truth the truths happening the truths being created and truth as action which arises in this very interesting political trajectory of um, uh, gandhi and in the way in which we should understand truth in politics and not reduce truth in politics to just certain kinds of uh, factual propositional truth it is also the notion of uh, truth in theater so uh, i was just want to end with um, this uh, gopal's uh, paper where when he talk when he is talking about uh, ambedkar and gandhi um because he says something very close to what i'm saying i want to read it out so um in truthfulness in gandhi he says for ambedkar being truthful is being ethical and not only uh, not only morally conscious but also accepting of the truth because truthful means an ethical action um an ethical ambed in ambedkar's conception being truthful means an ethical action has to be such that it ultimately leads to the emergence of an ethically moral stable social order truthfulness as ambedkar would see it that's what he says is nothing but truth performance you know it's an extremely important point which brings gandhi and ambedkar together in their notions of understanding truth as action it's a completely different formulation than what we would see normally about truth but i think um, you know uh, it it points out that it is something which uh, we in our democratic process in our understanding of democracy in being participants of democracy that the burden of judgment of truth and legitimizing truth rests so deeply on us and not on some kind of fake performances of politicians and that uh, in in that sense gandhi in spite of his disinterest in theater as makran told me he never wanted to watch theater was actually very close to theater in his practice in the notions of truth that arise in theater and in his own idea of power thing so one could um, perhaps end by saying um, that good politics is indeed good theater as all of us know it is good entertainment actually and good theater is always good politics you cannot divorce that you cannot say whatever good theater whichever way in which you want to understand good theater as far as the question of truth is concerned and it is not a surprise that today in india that both are lost good politics and good theater thank you matlab thoda mera hai ka थोड़ा? Okay, uh, uh, 
हा अध्यक्ष नव्हता पण यावेळेस तुम्ही अध्यक्ष बसवला तिथे आणि आणि मला खरंच त्या खुर्चीमध्ये बसून बरं वाटलं इतकं व्यापक विवेचन आय वुन से प्रक्षोभक प्रबोधक प्र विवेचन प्रोफेसर सुंदर सरकर यांनी केला आणि अनेक पैलू सत्य थिएटर आणि राजकारण याचे त्यांनी आपल्यासमोर मांडले यांचा माझा परिचय बराच जुना आहे आणि बरेचसे आम्ही भांडाभांडी करतो खरं म्हणजे एकमेकाला काढू बाळू मी काढून तो बाळू असं चाललेलं असतं आमच्या थिएटरच्या आणि आमची कलगी आमचा कलगीतुरासारखा चाललेला असतो आणि कलगीतुरा चांगल्या अर्थानं कारण तो एक डायलॉग फॉर्म आहे महाराष्ट्रामध्ये इट्स कलगीतुरा इज अ व्हेरी व्हेरी इम्पॉर्टंट रॅडिकल क्रिएटिव्ह डायलॉग फॉर्म दॅट दॅट नॉट द एलिट्स बट द कॉमन पीपल फ्रॉम द व्हिलेजेस ते द काळू बाळू तमाशा पर्सनॅलिटीज फ्रॉम सांगली कौलापूर आय मीन जस्ट इन केस यू आर इंटरेस्ट इन गोईंग टू कौलापूर यू कॅन जस्ट थिंक अबाउट इट तर ही हे सगळं त्यांनी मांडलं आपल्या पुढे आणि सगळ्यावरती कॉमेंट करणं सक्षमपणे एक शक्य नाही आहे मी आता सतीश कडे बघतो मी घाबरलो आहे थोडंसं आता कसं बोलायचं पण बोलतो सतीश माफ करा तर आय स्पीक इन मराठी फॉर नॉट दॅट आय नो मच गुड मराठी आय मीन पोहणे सो आय एम रिअली कॉन्शियस अबाउट इट हा सो अतिशय महत्त्वाचे मुद्दे मांडले पण आता प्रसंग असा की बापट सरांच्या संदर्भातला कार्यक्रम आहे मी त्याला स्मृती म्हणणार नाही त्याला वेगळं नाव आपण देऊया त्याला कारण स्मृती म्हणजे बा बापट सारखे मनात असतात ते आपल्या आपले विचार जागवत असतात आणि मी तर त्यांचा कलिग होतो डिपार्टमेंटमध्ये आणि त्यांना फार मी जोडून बघितले त्यांचे विचार जोडून बघितले पण शेवटी यांनी जे मुद्दा मांडला तिथूनच मला वाटतं आपण सुरुवात आय मीन द ट्रूथ रिप्रेझेंट इट्स सेल्फ टू रियालिटी ट्रूथ रिप्रेझेंट इट्स सेल्फ टू रियालिटी म्हणजे काय की पुट इट डिफरंटली ॲज ए बापट प्रोसे बापट ऑल इज लाईफ ट्राय टू ट्राय टू डू थिअरी फिलॉसॉफी थिएटर एस्थेटिक्स इज अ विज अ मल्टी डायमेन्शनल पर्सनॅलिटी ओनली टू हेल्प यू टू डिस्कवर व्हॉट इज ट्रूथ इन यू he provided different insights very creative insights to people so that they should be able to discover what is truth in them most of us actually fail to really grasp that and we are really unfortunate to really grasp that and he made several attempts to really see that there are limits in you that was his point as you said falsity is the precondition of really arriving at truth आणि बापट इन अ व्हेरी नाईस वे उट्स ए हो यो प्रेझेंटेशन काय किती सुंदर बोलला किती महत्त्वाचं बोलला वगैरे वगैरे सांगायचे ते पण त्यांना ते म्हणायचं नव्हतं कारण ते दॅट वॉज ऑल्सो आहे कॅन्ड ऑफ अ थिएट्रिकल परफॉर्मन्स जस्ट आणि ते आम्हाला सगळ्यांना माहिती होतं मग कारण आम्ही बोललो राहत इट ही वॉज जस्ट वंडरफुल पण जेव्हा ते प्रेमात पडायचे तेव्हा मग ते वेळेवर ते यायचे वेळ तुम्हाला नक्की द्यायचे बोलायसाठी वगैरे सो आय थिंक दॅट inside he actually would really induce in you to really discover what is what are your strengths and what are your weaknesses and he actually built up a tradition of scholars in 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 maharashtra and in in particular and in india in general so we should really uh, appreciate thank remember baba uh, professor bapat for the intellectual contribution that he has made to really create the generation of scholars who are thinking being and that is the truth of you being a thinker pan mudda asa hai ki how to arrive at truth yani anek mudde man let ki doubt ahe bare se tin char points tane man le pan atta aplya kada what is the source of truth why, why do you want to really discover truth what is the starting point not the end point what is the starting of really arriving at truth is to to be doubtful about it yourself and this is the डेकार यु नो इट्स अ डेकार थिंग पण मुद्दा असा आहे आपल्या राजकारणामध्ये आणि फेक न्यूजमध्ये आपल्याला माहितच नाही आपल्यामध्ये डाऊट आहे की नाही वी आर ॲक्च्युली लॉस द कॅपॅसिटी टू डाऊट युअर सेल्फ आवर सेल्फ असं झालेलं आहे आणि देर इज अ हायवे एक्सप्रेस हायवे मला माहिती आहे कुठं जायचं आहे अयोध्येला जायचं आहे कुठं मला माहिती आहे कुठं जायचं आहे 
त्यामुळे आय आम आय एम रिअली कम आय एम फॉर आय नो द ट्रूथ व्हेरी वेल इट इज ॲक्च्युअली फॉल्स बिकॉज डझन रिअली कवर दी रिॲलिटी विच इज विच इज युनिव्हर्सल इन 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 दम तर ते आपल्याला माहिती आहे की we are failing to create the sense of doubt among the among the among the among the students for example among the scholars for example among the young people tana prashna padat nahi hai they are not at the cross road cross road is nahi hai sagle aise cross road line banla to kadta kudha jaycha asa mudda hai tana mag vichar karala lagta means in a way very bad sense of heidegger what is thinking or we all to that maithe ne aplyala kudha jaycha to prashna aplyala padat nahi aplyala maithe kudha jaycha कोणाला कोणाला हाणायचं आहे कोणाला आता हेट करायचं आपलं पक्का माहिती आहे त्यामुळं ट्रूथ हॅज अ व्हेरी लिटिल चान्स टू सर्वाईव्ह आणि आय थिंक आय अग्री विथ लास्ट कॉमेंट व्हेरी डिप्रेसिंग सिच्युएशन आर कंट्री सो देर नो स्पेस फॉर डाऊट डबल देर दॅट स्पेस हॅज कम्प्लिटली रॅडिकली एलिमिनेटेड द पॉसिबिलिटी ऑफ बिंग ट्रूथफुल अँड आय शुड रिपीट विथ युअर परमिशन दॅट how to arrive at truth is to actually become truthful becoming truthful is to really chalk out a definite way to reach the truth and again this uh, gandhi ambedkar debate which is very important that gandhi you will always see not asking for any evidence to ambedkar about untouchability mai to tana baba saheb ambedkar na aspurshata hai ki nahi yacha badal prashna vicharna चुकीच आहे गांधीना समजलं होतं ही वॉज व्हेरी ट्रुथफुल टू नॉट वॉज दिस क्वेश्चन दिस पर्सन हु वॉज ऍक्च्युअली द व्हिक्टीम ऑफ दिस अंटचॅबिलिटी आणि ही गांधीज ट्रुथ वॉज दॅट हिअर दिस कॅपॅसिटी टू बिकम स्मॉल अनलाईक पॉलिटिशियन टुडे मोठमोठे पोस्टर लावतात कटआउट लावतात म्हणजे इट्स ऑल फेक फेकच आहे ना हे यू आर एलिवेट युअर इमेज विच इज नॉट ट्रू गांधींचा ट्रुथ होतं की ही वॉज हिअर दिस कॅपॅसिटी टू बिकम स्मॉल even to zero that zero had so much power so this is one way of looking at i mean truthfulness is very is very important and te apan karat ne apan evidence magto in propositional truth you actually ask for evidence and uh, i mean your philosopher sadashiv sadanan more is sitting here but i can always he me jo gustake karto ki bolte mi ata philosophy what is तर ते एव्हिडन्स मागतो आपण कुठे रेफरन्स दाखवा किती कोट केले दाखवा आणि अलीकडेच तो एक लेख लिहिला की आपलं ट्रूथ जे आहे ते आपल्याला पासवर्ड लागतो त्यातनं सिद्ध होतं आय मीन सम सम ऑफ द बिग इंटेलेक्चर्स ऑफ बिकम पासवर्ड त्यांचा पासवर्ड वापरल्याशिवाय आपलं फाईलच उघडत नाही नाही का तर ते अशा अशा या विरोधाभासामध्ये फॉल्स सिटीमध्ये आपण अडकलेलो आहोत आणि त्यामुळे ट्रूथकडे जाण्याची शक्यता फारच धुसच झालेली आहे तर आपण सगळ्या दे फॉर आय एम सेईंग आय डोंट आता हॉलमध्ये आपण सगळे बसलेलो आहोत पण आपल्याला इंटरलोक्युटर नाही आहे कोणाशी संवाद करायचा तो संवाद करणारा मनुष्यच गॅप झाला आहे आपण आपसातच संवाद करतोय रॅडिकल्स इंटरनेटवरती एकमेकांना आपले पिटिशन पाठवत असतात हो आय जस्ट डन इट हा ओके टिक मार्क करून मोकळं असतो हे आपण किती स्वतःला डिसिव्ह डिसिव्ह करतो we are actually deceiving ourselves by actually performing that you are actually a social activist on internet and this is fake it is this is really fake and actually abdal he sudha kalat nahi hai ki apni language itki badalli ata pahilanda ami vichar amcha kade ase ase shabd hai je amcha kanavati padayche thagari in political theory political theory mhanje mot mote thugs basle ते एकमेकांचं चोरतात हाणामारी करतात वाटमारी करतात आयडियाज पळवतात ठगरी आहे पण थांब ठगरी टू फेकरी हे जास्त भंगंबी राहतात आणि आपलं पुरेसं लक्ष त्याच्याकडे नाही आहे म्हणजे ॲज ॲज अम आय ॲज अ ॲज अ व्हेरी व्हेरी सेन्सिटिव्ह टीचर आय वुड फील सॅड अबाउट इट वाय दिस ट्रान्झेशन ऑन विच इज ॲक्च्युली गोईंग इन अ व्हेरी 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 डायग्रेशनल डिप्रेशन वे अन हाऊ टू अरेस्ट इट इज अ बिग इट्स अ बिग प्रॉब्लेम आणि आय डोंट नो दुसरा मुद्दा आणि जो मानला तो आपण लक्षात घेतोय तो असा की सत्य कुठे आहे म्हणजे ग्रंथात आहे ग्रंथातल्या कंटेंटमध्ये आहे की त्याच्या परिणामामध्ये आहे आणि हे थिएटरमध्ये आपल्याला दिसतं आणि आम्ही अनेकदा डिबेट्स केल्यात मला फारसं ना नॉलेज नाही आहे पण मी सतीच्या क्लासमध्ये बसेल वगैरे 
याचं एक उदाहरण असं आहे थिएटरमध्ये दिसतं आपल्याला ताबडतोब पण खरं तुम्हाला परिणामातनं सत्य जर शोधायचं असेल आणि त्याला जर सामोरं जायचं असेल तर आपल्याला आत्मचरित्र वाचायला लागते दोन उदाहरणं देतो मी एक नाव घेत नाही पण दलित आत्मचरित्र प्रसिद्ध झालं आणि त्याच्यावरती डॉक्टर भालचंद्र फडकेने कॉमेंट केले मी हे आत्मचरित्र वाचल्यानंतर माझ्या अंगाला हजार इंग्लंडने चावा घेतला असं मला वाटलं हा चावा घेणं इज ट्रूथ परिणामात यू फेल दॅट यू आर बिंग बिटन बाय वन थाउजंड स्कॉर्पियन्स आणि दॅट ते वाटणं हे सामाजिक वास्तवाबद्दलचं होतं सो वा दॅट ट्रूथ इज नॉट इंडिव्हिज्युअलाइज इट इज ऍक्च्युली अब्स्ट्रॅक्टेड फ्रॉम दी सोशल प्रॅक्टिस ऑफ अंटाचॅबिलिटी हे दलित ऑटोबायोग्राफर इज फेसिंग सो आय थिंक पण आपण काय करतो ॲज यू व्हेरी राईटली सेट स्किल ट्रेनिंग प्रोटोकॉल्स मेथॉलॉजिकल प्रोटोकॉल्स टू रीच द ट्रूथ अँड सदा फिलॉसॉफीमध्ये आपण तेच शिकवतो ना यू टू रीच ट्रूथ थ्रू फॉलोइंग प्रोटोकॉल नाही केलं तर तुम्हाला गेटच्या बाहेर यू आर नॉट अ फिलॉसॉफर यू आर अ फेक फिलॉसॉफर यू आर अ अपस्टार फिलॉसॉफर सगळे आपल्या दूषण देतात लोक पण हे या या आत्मचरित्रात आपल्याला ते सगळं दिसतं आहे की आपल्याला ते तिथपर्यंत पोहोचता येतं जाता येतं आणि हे जे ट्रेनिंग तुम्ही म्हणा यू सेट दॅट यु नो इट बिकम्स अ टिरियान इट बिकम्स अ मनोपाले दॅट इफ यू फॉलो दिस दे ओनली यू कॅन हॅव यू कॅन हॅव प्रिव्हिलेज यू कॅन हॅव प्रिव्हिलेज ॲक्सेस टू ट्रूथ नॉट अन ऑर्डिनरी ॲक्सेस बट यू हॅव प्रिव्हिलेज ॲक्सेस म्हणून आमची मुलं फिलॉसॉफीच्या वर्गामध्ये भटलेली असताना किंवा थिएटरच्या से थिएटर थिएटरच्या सेमिनारमध्ये बसले असताना कोपऱ्यात बसून असतात तर त्यांना ती भाषा ते प्रोटोकॉल मेथलॉजी माहिती नाही त्यामुळे ते प्रिपोजिशनल ट्रूथ त्यांना मिळू शकत नाही दे कॅन रीच द्या सो दॅट इज दी प्रॉब्लेम दे फॉर आय थिंक द ट्रूथ दॅट इज अवेलेबल टू मी दॅट इज व्हिजिबल टू मी थ्रू ॲक्शन इज द रिअल ट्रूथ दॅट एली दॅट इज ॲक्सेसेबल टू मी अँड आय कॅन ॲक्सेस दॅट ट्रूथ अँड इट कॅन इट कॅन स्पीक टू मी डायरेक्टली सो दॅट इज वन important point you are making but i would like to add aplya kada asa hai bhakt monopoly nahi hai truth chi sorry he jo moni nahi hai and this is a post modern critic of truth pan aplya kada maktedari hai satya chi ani ata ida radicals loka batlele astel pan apan satya chi maktedari aplya kada ghetlele asle mule apan itrana aplya ka satya cha takte cha patya ma khechat asto bedarkar pan तुम्हाला माहीत नाही तुम्ही मूर्ख आहे आमच्या पाठामागे आम्हाला कळले सत्य आणि कुठल्या पक्षातले आणि कुठल्या ह्याच्यातले लोक आहे माहिती आहेत आपल्याला आपण तरी नाव घ्यायला नको त्यामुळे ते एकटेच गेले पुढे लोक आलेले नाही आहेत ते आपल्या दिसतं राजकारणामध्ये ह्याच्याबद्दलचं चिंतन आपण कधी करणार आहोत म्हणून दे आय थिंक यू शुड ऑल्सो हॅव समथिंग टू डू विथ व्हॉट इज रिझन अँड व्हॉट इज बिंग रिझनेबल you are so reasoned by you are control over monopoly over truth that you don't really consider others as somebody who has the capacity to feel to talk reasonably with tyamule tumhi murkha kalatle tumhala amala kalalela rajkaran ani te ekte jube astat tyana 15 mata padtat je khota balta tyana pushkal mata padtat that's the problem with uh, so there is a hegemony and monopoly these are two uh, problems that we are we are actually facing in this in this country i think then that's the uh, uh, point i thought i will just make okay then last point last two points actually i don't want to uh, make it a long story saglana jevale jayche amale jevale jayche you also made this point uh, there is a performance of lies and that lies is the constitutive condition of truth that is what that you can't really reach truth you can't even imagine truth but lies you have to have some kind of a special handle and politicians do have that special handle to construct you into performative lies and that's why theater and as you said the theater and performative lies come together आपल्याला खोटं वागायची असत्य वागायची ट्रेनिंग घ्यायला लागते आणि पॉलिटिशियन्स ते घेतात ट्रेनिंग म्हणजे सगळेच पॉलिटिशियन नाही म्हणत पण काही जर पॉलिटिशियन चांगले आहेत लेट इज नॉट 
blame everybody in totality unless you construct somebody into a perpetual state of lies you actually cannot really con- establish your control over power and over society or sensibility and as you very rightly interestingly said that you refuse to really you actually participate in your own domination by actually construct getting constructed as as the as as the liar you lie when you said you know you you don't want to really come to the conclusion coming to the conclusion also grasping some kind of a truth no you avoid that very consciously because you are constructed as as in, in a performative lie and that's why you change uh change channels and channels don't give you any they don't they don't dish out truth na marathi channels to me sati 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 ch veglo bhanna tyacha badal an tyacha kasa theater cha na apan sat bollo ki theater ani marathi channel channels madhe kit tari qualitative gunatmak farak hai an theater jasto progressive hai ani tv channels madhe je kai serial dagota te atyanta fake hai manje ata mi janvi purak kai bare vatat pan bolte kashas hai एक स्टोरी सगळ्यात याच्यामध्ये चाललेली असते आणि त्याच्याबद्दल वाच्यता करायला नको जास्त पण दॅट्स दी दॅट्स द स्टेट ऑफ अवर इस्थेटिक सेन्स अँड यू डोंट हॅव इस्थेटिक सेन्स ॲट ऑल आय मीन दॅट्स अनदर स्टोरी तर हे सगळे महत्वाचे मुद्दे यांनी मांडलेत आणि बरेचसे मुद्दे मला समजले बरेचसे समजले सुद्धा नाहीत मॅथमॅटिक्स आणि ह्याचे आणि ते मला एकूणच त्यांचं भाषण अत्यंत आवडलं आहे आणि मकरान मला संधी दिली आणि आपणही ऐकून घेतला त्याबद्दल आपले आभार आणि थँक्यू व्हेरी मच सुंदर फॉर सच अ ब्रिलियंट प्रेझेंटेशन दॅट यू मेड इस्टन आय आय होप दिस अ रिअल ट्रिब्युट टू प्रसो बापट्स इंटलेक्च्युअल मेमरी थँक्यू सो मच